My name is Tanya Ferguson. I'm a hip and pelvic surgeon here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm going to spend the next half an hour or so talking to you about the radiology of the normal as well as the abnormal hip, particularly as it pertains to osteoarthritis. So the normal hip. Well, the normal hip is, as we've already discussed, the femur. And the femur articulates with that acetabulum. The femur and the acetabulum are separated by what we see radiographically as a joint space. Like I tell patients, the x-rays don't see cartilage. They don't see the labrum. They don't see anything that doesn't have ossification or deep fibrous near calcification in it. So instead, what we see between the acetabulum and the femur is this space. And we use that space as a metric of the quality of the patient's articular cartilage, okay? And we're gonna talk about that quite a lot when we start talking about the pathology of arthritis. Now, the acetabulum is part of a larger structure, the anominate bone. The anominate bone is made up of three separate bones that fuse during childhood. The ilium here is the craniomose aspect of the anominate bone. It articulates through the triradiate cartilage seen here in an unfused situation, the triradiate cartilage with the anterior pubic bone and the posterior ischial bone. The pubis moves anterior medially to articulate with the other uh, pubic bone through the pubic symphysis. Now the pubic symphysis is an actual joint and it can become diseased. It's one of the few joints that we have in the body that's unilateral, there's just one of them. Posteriorly, the ilium articulate with the sacrum at the SI joint, and you can see that on the radiograph here. The sacrum shown in red here then articulates with the lumbar sacral junction or the lumbar vertebrae at the lumbar sacral junction. And this has really gotten a lot of interest in arthroplasty recently. We're gonna talk about this pretty extensively as we start talking about the relationship of the pelvis and its movement at the lumbosacral junction, which is where the sensation of pelvic tilt occurs, which we've really started to focus on with hip replacement surgery. And we'll speak about more later. Well, what does the arthritic hip look like and what is arthritis exactly? Arthritis is any condition that causes the cartilage in a joint to break down, and in this case, in the hip. And what that can look like on x-ray, and if we'll look at the patient's right side here, you can see that the femoral head is no longer separated from the acetabular surface by a joint space. In fact, that joint space has gone completely. This is a very advanced state of arthritis here. In fact, to the extent that not only have we lost that joint space, but that bone has started to wear away at the socket and has eroded through the subchondral bone of the acetabulum, that is the bone right underneath the cartilage, and has started to break down, much like a cavity in a tooth, break down the bone on the acetabular side, and you can see these large cystic changes. This is a very advanced state of arthritis. You can imagine that this woman has gotten very stiff. When she tries to move her leg, it doesn't move, and when it does, it's exquisitely painful to her, particularly in rotation, and inflection. Every time she attempts movement, this, the femoral head, rubs the acetabulum further. Over time, the body starts to create these osteophytes or grow more bone around the femoral head. My very simplistic thought here is that the body's reaction to pain is to stop you from doing what is painful and therefore the body grows bone around the hip and stops the movement of the femoral head. We call this bony growth osteophyte formation. In this case, we'll see that she's got an osteophyte forming on the femoral head inferiorly, some osteophyte formation of the acetabulum superiorly or cranially. When we look at the lateral radiograph, we can see further that complete destruction of the joint space and articulation of the femur's bone with that of the acetabulum, 
She's worn through that subchondral bone. We can see some bony buildup here or osteophyte formation here and here as well. Functionally, this patient has a stiff limb. She really has virtually no rotatory motion in this limb. Her leg length is slightly unequal. Through the process of the loss of the joint space, we lose millimeter by millimeter the length in the extremity. And that's something we monitor preoperatively as it's a variable we want to restore during the arthroplasty procedure. Her foot becomes externally rotated. During the arthritic process, because of these medial osteophytes or the medial articulation, the limb starts to get stuck in an outward or external rotation deformity. This also becomes important when we start interpreting the radiographs for preoperative planning. She has a very difficult time going up and down stairs, which requires a lot of motion out of the hip. And bending down to touch her foot has been out of the picture for at least a year. So that's some of the functional um, consequences of having developed arthritis. This is what we do in a case like this. We do a hip replacement surgery and the hip replacement surgery starts to make a lot more sense when you understand what the arthritic process has, has, has meant for the patient. We've developed a new bearing surface. So we've cut the head ball out. We've removed all of the articular cartilage. In this case, we've ground down through that bone so that she doesn't have any irregular bone. And in doing so with that reaming process, we get down to good bleeding bone that's spherical in nature and that can accept the shell of the acetabulum. That's gonna be the interface with the bone, the acetabular shell. That's gonna be impacted into the patient's native bone and it'll be stable at initial placement, but then the patient's bone has to grow onto or into that implant to definitively stabilize it. Similarly, on the femoral side, the femoral stem has been placed down the hollow femur. It has been placed in a way that has um, taken advantage of the shape of the proximal femur, which is curved. It's a curved implant that has a three point bend and contact with the proximal femur. It's filling on the internal surface. It's collared here, resting in, in this particular case, this is a collared implant. The collar is resting on the area where the neck cut has occurred. But then the bearing surface, that which is now gonna provide the patient with the frictionless motion is gonna be in this case, that ceramic head ball articulating on that polyethylene plastic surface. We no longer need the acetabular labrum. There are common causes of arthritis and then there are less common causes of arthritis. The most common cause, and what we'll talk about a lot today, is what I'll call primary arthritis. It just happened. That cartilage just wore down over time for whatever reason to the point that a hip replacement may be relevant. Deformities can cause arthritis, and we'll talk about dysplasia when the socket is insufficient, and thus the force distribution of weight bearing gets concentrated in just one portion of the socket such that that cartilage breaks down early in life. Femoral acetabular impingement is the opposite where there's either too much femur or too much socket, a mismatch of some sort such that impingement occurs and that can scrape away the cartilage in the joint leading to arthritis. Trauma fractures can lead to a situation of cartilage breakdown either on the socket side or the femoral side. Infection, bacteria eat through cartilage like nobody's business. And then avascular necrosis is a cause of arthritis where the femoral head loses its blood supply for whatever reason, often for no reason obvious to anyone. The femur loses its blood supply and it subsequently starts to deteriorate and that causes arthritis by breaking down ultimately the cartilage on first the femoral and then on the acetabular side. So in orthopedics, we often say the x-rays don't lie. The x-rays don't lie, okay? But it's very interesting how difficult it can be to interpret what the x-ray is telling us. So we're gonna spend the rest of our time talking about the x-rays on a very, very explicit level so that you can understand what the x-rays are trying to tell you.
Radiological landmarks that we observe in the normal patient really help us understand what's going on in pathology. So we're gonna start with the normal landmarks and there are some very normal and reproducible landmarks first on the acetabular side and then on the femoral side and apply how those landmarks can get disrupted during a pathological process and that helps us with our diagnosis. So we've been through this. We know that the uh, joint, the hip joint is the femur articulating with the acetabulum separated by this joint space on the x-rays. In the arthritic process, that joint space will start to break down and then ultimately go away altogether. Again, this on the far right side, a very severe case of arthritis in a woman who probably coulda, shoulda, woulda had her hip replaced years ago if it weren't for other factors. But you can see here in the center of the screen, we've had some narrowing of that joint space. The subchondral bone on the acetabular side has gotten sclerotic. It's bright. In this case, I've, I lightened the x-ray so that you can see the detail better on the slideshow. But in, in the non-inverted way, this would be a bright white. You can see here in the dark, the dark black. We can see some osteophyte formation. And on the far right side, again, that subchondral bony breakdown where you can tell that this subchondral bone of the acetabulum is seeing a force it's not used to. This is commonly called bone on bone arthritis and it really is. When we start talking about the lines of the acetabulum, we're gonna refer to the sawbone pelvis here to help understand what these lines actually are. The first line we'll talk about is called the iliopectineal line. There are six lines that really help us understand the acetabulum itself. And all of these lines have started to be used during the arthroplasty procedure to help us understand component positioning. And then on the, in the most eloquent terms are used as part of the in, intraoperative navigational systems that are used in operating rooms today. So the iliopectineal line is often called the pelvic brim or the brim line. The iliopectineal line is a density of the bone that correlates very closely with the dense bone of the pelvic brim. This is the bone in the far medial aspect of the pelvis. It supports the anterior portion of the acetabulum and is used in some of our navigational software systems as an orienting marker for the hip itself. The ilioischial line is seen here. It is a line that derives not from the posterior border of the bone or the retroacetabular surface, but rather from the internal surface here. This, is, this portion of the pelvis is called the quadrilateral surface or the ilioischial surface. This quadrilateral surface on the internal surface of the bone correlates commonly with this landmark or this line on the x-ray itself, okay? So that's important. This is a landmark we use in arthroplasty all the time um, uh, for preoperative planning as a landmark in surgery and for our post-surgical exploration. Again, it is created by this dense bone in what we'll call the posterior column of the acetabulum. The acetabulum is supported by an anterior column or the anterior structure, and then the posterior structure, much like an inverted Y. The socket itself lies in between them, and these are the structural components to the socket itself, okay? So that is the area there that corresponds with the ilioischial line. It's important to recognize that that line is not the posterior border of bone and it's not the medial surface of the socket. It is this posterior column portion of the quadrilateral surface. The posterior border of the bone or the landmarks that make up the posterior border of the anatomy of the bone, the ischial tuberosity, is far medial to this area. And the ischial spine is seen here medially. These are the posterior landmarks of the anominate bone. The ilioischial line is often used to help us understand the depth 
of the socket. These are x-rays demonstrating arthritic conditions associated with a coxa profunda or a deep socketed hip and on the right, protrusio acetabuli. These are often rheumatological conditions or conditions associated with a rheumatological breakdown. The arthritic process is far more medial than the images I just showed you, which involve the superior lateral joint first. These are a medially erosive arthritic condition. We'll start on the far left-hand side. In this case, we can see that the hips fossa, okay, or the cotyloid fossa extends medial to the ilioischial line. Okay, this is now sclerotic bone. This is a very deep socket. You can see out laterally, we've developed some osteophytes due to the abnormal wear patterns of this kind of a socket. This is, even though if you look just in this area right here, there's a lot of joint space there, isn't there? That doesn't mean this patient doesn't have an arthritic condition. We see a lot of arthritic changes with the osteophytes, the asphericity of the femoral head here, and the, and the deep uh, hip socket. This is a very painful hip. And we're going to go through one of these cases at the end, actually. Here, as we get into a protrusio, the term protrusio is reserved for the cases in which the femoral head has passed the ilioischial line, not just the fossa, but the head itself has passed the ilioischial line. And on the far right hand side, that femoral head and this new sclerotic bone has passed not just the ilioischial line, but the iliopectineal line as well. This is a protrusio in which the femoral head is now intrapelvic. These are very severe deformities and they become very symptomatic early in the patient's disease course. The teardrop, now that's a, that's a term I know you all know. The teardrop is without question the most confusing landmark on the patient's pelvis. The teardrop is made up of a variety of osseous landmarks on the internal region of the socket where it is an overlap of the radiographic beam with these anterior structures here, the posterior structures here, and a little bit of this, oops, uh, yep, it's right, this area of that quadrilateral surface. So it's actually a fairly complex landmark. It doesn't define the medial wall. In fact, Mythbuster, there is no such thing as a medial wall. This is a medial landmark. It's medial in the cotyloid surface. I'm sorry, in the cotyloid fossa, where the cotyloid fossa is the deepest recess of the hip joint. The cartilage, again, forming a 300 degree horseshoe with an inset fossa. That fossa is the area where the landmark of the teardrop occurs, okay? So that's pretty confusing. I don't mean it to be, but I will tell you as a surgeon operating the hip for over 15 years, it's a confusing landmark. And it's used quite a lot in arthroplasty surgery. The teardrop with its relationship to the ilioischial line, and I've also drawn out the ischial spine, this landmark, these combined landmarks really are often used to describe the medial acetabulum, okay? This is where we will look to as far as component positioning. In surgery, I typically want to get my component placed down through the floor of the cotyloid fossa. You can see the teardrop here and the ilioischial line here, the teardrop here, the ilioischial line here. I use this as an index of how deep into the socket I've gotten. I never want, if I can help it, I never want my implant to pass that ilioischial line. Remember what makes that line. It is this area, again, of the cotyloid, uh, let's see, here we go. This area, I'm sorry, of the posterior column. If I breach that, it means I have perforated the po posterior column and, and now in an intrapelvic environment. So I want to avoid that. So that's one time where I'm using the relationship 
of the uh, teardrop to the ilioischial line during surgery. And when I pre-op plan my operations, I know I'm going to want my acetabular component at least down through and to the teardrop. Okay. That's where I'm going to ultimately position my acetabular component. Now, we also use the relationship of the ilioischial line and the teardrop to give us a sense of the rotation of the pelvis as it pertains to the x-ray beam. Okay, so bear with me here, but this is an x-ray taken intraoperatively and shown here, this is the position of the fluoroscope at the time of this x-ray. This is the ilioischial line. Here is the teardrop. And at this point, that ilioischial line is on the medial most border of the teardrop. As I change the orientation of the x-ray beam by rotating the C-arm away from the patient, okay, or if I tilt the patient away from the C-arm, that ilioischial line now bisects the teardrop, okay? And as we come to a far lateral degree, I further rotate the C-arm. Look how now the ilioischial line's appearance is lateral to the teardrop. This all seems very minute, and it is, but it's critically important when we start trying to understand the quality of a radiograph, and certainly when we're trying to understand, in this case, the acetabular version. I'm gonna come back to that, but in going forward here, we're talking about acetabular version next. The acetabulum, here is the anterior rim and the posterior rim, and I'm gonna go through those landmarks in just a moment. But as I move the C-arm and rotate it with respect to the pelvis, the anterior rim now becomes recessed compared to the posterior rim, and the socket appears antiverted. I'm gonna go into this in great detail in the next couple of, uh, in the next section, but these small rotatory uh, imperfections in an X-ray can make it difficult to pre-op plan in a, a patient's case, are critical when assessing the implantation of the components um, during surgery and are very important in understanding the post-operative acetabular component position, okay? I'm gonna explain that more as we get through this section where we'll talk about the acetabular markers for assessment of the, um, uh, of the rotation. So here again, we have, or I, I'm sorry, as we talk about the acetabular markers assessment for offset, okay? Here we have that teardrop and the ilioischial line. We're gonna use those as fairly consistent landmarks in the patient's acetabulum or pelvis. When we then look to determine what the global offset is, or the offset of the femur from the pelvis, We'll take a landmark in the femur, and in this case, we use the proximal third of the femur, its trajectory of the femoral canal, and we draw a line at a 90 degree angle there to a point on the medial pelvis. And we need to use the same point every time. I use the ilioischial line. Some people use the teardrop, and some people use a point where the ilioischial line and the teardrop overlap. Now, I'll tell you right now, your x-ray that you might be dealing with may have one or the other or none of those as obvious landmarks. That's because the rotation of the patient's pelvis with respect to the x-ray beam changes the appearance of that x-ray. In this case, we'll, we'll measure that offset from the femoral line to, in my case, the ilioischial line, and that's going to define the patient's global offset. And I'm going to talk a lot more about offset at the end of the talk. Okay. So that's another time where we use the ilioischial line or the teardrop for as an assessment of the medial acetabulum. Next, I want to talk about the periphery of the articular surface itself. And the first landmark that we look at is the radiological roof. The radiological roof is here. That is what I see on x-ray, okay, see that? That's the radiological roof. Now that pertains to just a very small aspect of the articular surface. So looking at the joint, 
all of this area of the joint is important as a roof to the femoral head and provides a weight bearing structure. But what we see on x-ray is just this small area, the cranial most aspect of the articular subchondral bone. And it becomes dense because when we change it to an AP pelvis, that area becomes tangential to the x-ray line and we see it on the x-ray, okay? So that is the area that defines the radiological roof. I showed you an x-ray earlier where that roof had been eroded through and the subchondral bone that creates the roof was gone because that bone had been eroded completely, okay? Looking to the anterior and the posterior rims, which is what we can see on the x-ray, this will define the anterior and posterior border of the acetabulum itself and helps us define the orientation of the acetabulum, okay? To do so, we need to train our eyes and we're gonna start with the posterior rim. The posterior acetabular rim comes down here to the ischium. I think we can all agree to that. So we're gonna put our eye to a point at the subcotyloid groove, which is this groove right underneath the cotyloid fossa, okay? We'll put a point there and say that, well, we know the posterior wall spans from the radiological roof to the subcotyloid groove as it does. And you can see a shadow there, okay? That shadow is the shadow of the posterior rim of the acetabulum. The anterior rim is harder, okay? So the anterior rim is obscured by the femoral head for sure. And we're not that used to looking at it. It is recessed in more medially on the pelvis. So it's much harder to see. Professor Letournel taught us to look to the top of the obturator foramen, okay? We can all see the roof of the obturator foramen. And if you draw a point in your mind at the lateral most aspect of the obturator foramen, and now look for a shadow between the radiological roof and the roof of the obturator frame. And you can see that shadow now, can't you? So there is between these two points, a shadow that is the rim of the anterior acetabulum, okay? So see that there? There is that anterior acetabular rim. It commonly has a point of reflection where the iliopsoas crosses over the anterior hip joint. So that there from the anterior aspect of the, um, I'm sorry, from the uh, top of the obturator foramen to the radiological roof, that shadow is gonna be your anterior rim. Looking at it closer, you can see that the acetabulum is antiverted. Okay, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the socket is more open anteriorly than it is posteriorly. The posterior, and, and this is something we replicate in arthroplasty, okay? That posterior rim is more lateral than the anterior rim. The posterior rim is lateral, the anterior rim is recessed or medial. And that's important because it is that relationship. We need more structure in the back of our hip joint to support our weight bearing, okay? This is more prominent laterally to support squatting. Any time the hip comes up into flexion, it's gonna load the posterior acetabulum. And we need the anterior rim recess so we can flex our hip up and that there is room there. So when the socket allows, if, if, if we can imagine that the front, this is the front of the socket, your hip needs to be able to come up and there needs to be structure posteriorly to support the femoral head. So the acetabulum is antiverted in the normal scenario. And when we perform an arthroplasty, we antivert the acetabular component appropriately. The other parameter here that we start looking at is the slope of the socket. Okay, so that is how open is the socket. Normal sockets are all over the place and there is no absolute normal but I shoot for a replicated 45 degrees of, an, of inclination or slope in my socket when I do a hip arthroplasty, okay? We're gonna talk about this more in just a second, but this, this measurement of slope is something we look at in the native joint, 
I take care of a lot of patients with this dysplastic condition. And I'm gonna show you a case of that, but in the dysplastic condition, not only is the hip shallow and the femoral head not covered by the socket, but that socket is sloped upwards substantially. We don't wanna replicate an upward sloping socket in surgery or we'll have problems with instability. So we want to create a, a slope of a relatively normal mechanical socket, which is at about 45 degrees of inclination or slope. This, this degree that I, or this, this opening angle or inclination angle drawn on the AP radiate graph is not a great or accurate method of assessing the inclination or slope of the socket, okay? Um, I'm gonna come back to that in just a second. Here's a case, we're gonna go through our landmarks here. Here's a case of a patient with an atypical baseline socket, okay? So let's start with the radiological roof. Here's the radiological roof, okay? We can see that dense bone right here. We can see a subchondral cyst starting on the side of the joint, indicating some atypical wear, but there is our radiological roof. Now let's look for the posterior rim and it gets harder here, okay? Let's start with that subcotyloid groove or that point at the inferior aspect of the acetabulum as it meets the ischium. And find a, find a shadow, find a shadow that comes between these points. Well, I see it here really well. I don't see it up here real well, but I can see it here really well. And I'm gonna take some artistic leeway and tell you that that's the posterior rim. Now let's look at the anterior rim. There's the obturator. You see, it's pretty squinty in this scenario. That is to say, it's not very tall, our obturator foramen, but we can still find its lateral most point. And if we're looking for a shadow, well, here is our anterior, uh, and, and by the way, that uh, obturator foramen typically does hit just at the point of the inferior aspect of the teardrop and at the base of the ilioischial line, just to throw our old landmarks in there. And uh, now we can look and see here is our anterior rim. Look at how prominent that is. It is not recessed as it should be. It is far lateral. It is overwhelming the posterior rim here in a way that in fact, we call this a cranial upper crossover sign where the anterior rim is more lateral than the posterior rim. This is called acetabular retroversion. It is really hard on a joint, okay? It's really hard on the hip because instead of having a nice, Anverted socket, we have a retroverted socket, okay? It gets impinged during weight bearing early and there's posterior instability. Do we wanna put our hip joint in like that? No, do we wanna put the acetabular component in retroverted just because the patient has a retroverted socket? We really don't. That will lead to posterior instability and dislocation. So in this case, we really need to understand what we see on the x-rays because we want to go against the patient's native anatomy and put in an antiverted hip socket, which we can do remembering that we want an anterior rim recess compared to the posterior rim and a slope defined by some of the landmarks we've already talked about located well according to the patient's ilioischial line and teardrop. And this is a picture of her x-ray afterwards. She now has much more motion than she had before surgery because she's not impinging because of that acetabular retroversion. And she has an anverted hip socket. So I mentioned that the inclination angle of the acetabular diameter does not equate the true cup inclination. This is where x-rays, they don't lie. They're just so much smarter than our eyes that we can't necessarily um, accommodate that with a simple measurement like 45 degrees. And I'm gonna show you this because it's becoming more and more relevant as we go to intraoperative navigation during surgery. When the cup does not have any inclination, I'm sorry, when the cup does not as a spherical structure have no version at all, 
It's not antiverted. It's simply changing in slope. Then this angle is 100% perfect. It's exactly right for a non antiverted cup. However, and if I can get this guy to play, as the cup, so as it comes up without antiversion, that is perfect. But as we add antiversion, the measurement decreases. So even though the cup is still only 45 degrees inclined, that measurement, as we change the antiversion of the hip, as we increase the antiversion, so when we have no antiversion at all, it is that 45 degrees is accurate. But as we add antiversion, this inclination angle starts to get lower, even though it's still at 45 degrees. See that right there? Now, if we measure it, it's 42, even though the cup inclination is still 45 degrees. So this measurement, simply taking this measurement does not account for the inclination, I'm sorry, the antiversion of the cup. That is where the, the ellipse that we start talking about that's now been programmed into fluoroscopic navigation, that ellipse takes into, the, into account the trigonometry. So those are the parameters that we typically use that are always there that we started, uh, that are always there in a normal pelvis that we started to use as part of our understanding both of arthritis, but also how we're going to plan the arthroplasty. There's another value that has really become important to me as I've become nuanced with my hip replacement surgery. And that's looking at the morphology, morphology of the obturator foramen. The obturator foramen is a very easy thing for us to see on the x-ray and its orientation or its morphology can give us indications of how much rotation is in the, the x-ray and how much tilt is going on in the x-ray. Let's start with rotation. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about the ischial lines uh, relationship with the teardrop, okay? Now we're gonna get a little more, more nuanced. We're gonna look at another parameter and that is gonna be the medial to lateral, medial to lateral diameter of the obturator foramen. When we look at that and take this particular X-ray into account, we can see it's not perfect, right? There is, in this case, a little rotation of the pelvis away from the left and towards the right, such that the diameter, the medial to, medial to lateral diameter of the obturator foramen is greater on one side than on the other side. The, the uh, pelvis has rolled into the beam a little bit so that we see more obturator on the one side than the other side. Okay, who gives a whoop? I sure as heck don't. The reason I care is that those slight rotational changes affect the appearance radiographically of the version of the socket. Okay, so let me show you that. And, and this is just showing that as we, and my dog kind of got involved here, but as we try to turn the pelvis, you can see that that obturator width changes by changing the rotation of the pelvis as it pertains to the X-ray beam. So this, we saw this X-ray before. And what I told you is I would come back to it to explain how this rotation can affect the appearance of the hips version. This is all the same hip. On the far, here on the far left-hand side, what we see is the ischial line is lateral to the teardrop. And let's just look also at the morphology of the obturator foramen, medial to lateral diameter. As we start to move to the left, and oh, and I'm sorry. Now let's also look at the anterior and posterior rims, the anterior rim here and the posterior rim here, okay? Let's imagine that that's our good AP pelvis, our true AP pelvis. That's, let's imagine, reminiscent of the planning or the preoperative AP pelvis. Now in surgery, let's imagine we get this X-ray. So in the middle, when the CRM either rolls over slightly or the pelvis rolls away slightly, the ischial line starts to move laterally. It's now bisecting the uh, teardrop and the obturator foramen is wider, okay? This is all just a, a symptom of having the pelvis rotated ever so slightly compared to the radiographic beam. We can also see that the anterior rim has moved medially compared to the posterior rim so the joint is now starting to look slightly 
recessed anteriorly or antiverted compared to where it was there. And in the far case, now our obturator width is much greater. The ilioischial line is lateral to the teardrop and the appearance of the version is substantial. So if you're using your X-ray intraoperatively and <clears throat> you put an implant in thinking this is the correct version, but the patient's preoperative environment is more like this, you might put your cup in a little bit more antiverted than you expected. Again, that's where some of the nuances of the uh, acetabular indices are kind of taken over by some of the software systems that we use, which are just better at doing that trigonometry than I am in the middle of surgery. These relationships are also affected by parallax. So what is parallax? Parallax is this idea that with an X-ray, X-ray is like a beam of light. At its, when it's centered like a laser, it's very bright in the middle of the beam but it dissipates laterally, right? Okay, so same with the X-ray beam. At the, at the point where it is most focused or concentrated, whatever is in the center of the beam, it is as close to the real anatomy, the radiograph obtains as close to the real anatomy as possible. But as the X-ray beam passes to the periphery, there, it is affected by this phenomenon of parallax, such that the outer periphery of the X-ray beam, those relationships appear as though they're rotated compared to the beam itself. They, in effect, are. Let's take, for example, an X-ray that is an AP pelvis and an AP of the hip. This is the same patient, okay? And if we now look at these parameters, you guys have learned closing up on a close up here on the left, where the obturator foramen is not nearly as wide as on the right, the acetabular, and this is what happens with an AP pelvis, it's because the x ray beam is coming on a trajectory from the internal or centered area to the periphery of the field we see less antiversion than when we now bring the x-ray in and center over the hip and the x-ray is directly on it. So this is a much more accurate representation of the patient's actual anatomy. That's why if you're using intraoperative navigation, we'll get an, an x-ray of the pelvis to define some of the landmarks, but when we actually navigate the placement of the acetabular component, we want to be centered in so that the hip center of rotation is in the center of the X-ray beam. That indicates that, that ensures that the perception of the anatomy we care about is as, as unaffected by parallax as possible, okay? The next indice I wanna to talk to you about is the pelvic tilt because we use the obturator height to assess the tilt of the pelvis as well. The pelvic tilt is a concept of the orientation, the sagittal plane or the lateral plane orientation of the pelvis as it pertains to the spine. And when we move, our pelvis moves at the lumbosacral junction, okay? When the pelvis tilts posteriorly, as it does, as I stand up, I, when I'm sitting, I'm in a fairly lordotic position. As I stand up, my pelvis is gonna rotate back. That's compared to a neutral position. And when I lay down, or if I go into a position where I go like this, a lordotic position, my pelvis tilts to the front or anteriorly. And that's all well and good, and, but it's, I bring it up because it has become a huge focus in hip replacement surgery. Um, there are some very strong concerns that, uh, well, and the evidence shows that with some of these changes in pelvic tilt, either over time or with positional changes or with spinal fusion, this can lead to instability in the hip joint. Turns out that this one here on the left, that's the supine x-ray. Patient's laying down, and I'm just going to say, take a look at her obturator foramen, okay? The obturator foramen are a pretty good way of assessing pelvic tilt, 
Here, they're very squinty, okay? When she's in the supine position, those foramen are, are tilted down, anteriorly tilted, tilted down, and the x-ray appearance is squinty. When she stands up, look at the massive change in her pelvic position between laying down and standing up. She has some uh, spine, uh, spinal um, changes, uh, uh, deformities that are part of this for sure, but it's not completely atypical in a young flexible spine to have this much change in pelvic tilt. And what I look at radiographically is the height of the uh, obturator foramen, okay? When we look at the acetabular version, okay, here on the left side in the supine position, there's our posterior rim, here's our anterior rim. When I take this x-ray in the supine position, she almost looks retroverted. She almost looks like she's got too much anterior rim and this is a retroverted socket. But look what happens when she stands up. Her pelvis tilts and it opens up the acetabulum. Here's her posterior rim and the anterior rim. So as you stand up, just think about what's happening to your acetabulum. They open up and they become more antiverted, right? I'm gonna move on to the femur now. And when we talk about the femur, we'll talk about the femoral head. We'll talk about the neck shaft angle. We'll talk about the profiles of the lesser and greater trochanters, which help us in surgery. We're gonna go into this concept of offset, both global and femoral offset. And then we'll talk about the relationship of the femur to the socket or to the pelvis as it pertains to both leg length and uh, version. So the femoral head, it should be spherical. It should have a center of rotation, okay? And it should have a natural offset at the head neck junction. And that allows for the, the sphericity of the head and that offset at the head neck junction allows for flexion of the hip joint in the antiverted acetabulum. Here's a, a case of a patient who has an aspherical socket. So he has no indentation here. This is sometimes called a pistol grip deformity, but it's also a very common cam morphology associated with femoral acetabular impingement. When this guy brings his femur up into flexion, it impinges on the acetabular labrum early and then with further attempts at flexion causes a camming mechanism which scrapes the internal sockets cartilage. And this is a very common cause of early arthritis in men. The femoral head should be centered within the acetabulum and we measure that, I measure it uh, in two ways. First, the distance of the femoral head's center to the ilioischial line or any medial landmark you'd like to use, you now learn two, okay or Shenton's line. And Shenton's line is this line drawn from the inferior medial femoral neck continuing on to the, the roof of the obturator foramen. And it should be smooth, okay? Here's an example, here are two examples where Shenton's line is disrupted and there is a great divide between the center of the femoral head and the ilioischial line. In the case on the right, this is, I'm sorry, the case on the left, this is a developmental dysplasia, congenital hip dysplasia treated without treatment in youth that has led the femoral head to almost dislocation, but subluxation. The term subluxation indicates that there is still some relationship between the head and uh, some relationship of the joint. In the case of the hip, this is a relationship between the head and the socket in some way, rather than a complete dislocation where there's no further any relationship whatsoever. On the right side, you can see that the femoral head is subluxed, but this is because of arthritis, okay? The ilioischial line here, the center of rotation here, it is laterally and superiorly displaced. There has been a large amount of medial osteophyte form here in the center joint, and the center of the femoral head is subluxed laterally. This is something I'm going to want to improve upon in an arthroplasty where I'm gonna to want to recenter the femoral head and create a better relationship with the center of rotation of the joint with respect to the medial uh, landmarks like the ilioischial line and the teardrop. So here's the femoral head and it's really far away. It's sublux, it should be here, okay? And that's something I can affect during arthroplasty. Here are uh, examples of actual dislocations. In this case, a traumatic dislocation where the 
patient's femoral head dislocated. Posteriorly, you can see it's the femoral head is overlapping the radiological roof. It is out of the socket and the, cent and the center of the femoral head is here versus the ilioischial line here. That's a complete dislocation. And here in the case of a patient who's undergone arthroplasty with a posterior, very significant posterior superior hip dislocation. The lesser trochanter is a posterior landmark. So here you can see when I'm rotating the femur around, as I externally rotate the femur, you see more lesser trochanter, okay? So in an image where there's more internal rotation, you see very little lesser trochanter. When there's more external rotation, you see more external, you see more of the lesser trochanter. Also, the greater trochanter has more pro has prominence anteriorly and posteriorly. You can see that contour here, and I didn't show you the posterior femur, and we can see that on x-rays, okay? So here on the far left-hand side, no lesser trochanter, highly internally rotated limb. This is our normal state that we've been looking at this entire case. And then this is a case where the patient has more external rotation and we see more of the lesser trochanter, okay? Here is a case that I did recently. And if we look from side to side, we can say, and I'll tell you right now, arthritis commonly results in inability to rotate your femur in rotation. And we lose preferentially our ability to internally rotate the femur. So it gets stuck or it gets pushed into an outward rotational deformity. Commonly patient's foot is at an angle compared to the other side outwardly rotated five to 10 degrees, maybe more. And this patient, if you look at the patient's affected side, we see more lesser trochanter than on the unaffected side, okay? So this limb is outwardly rotated compared to this limb. Here's the, ex the lesser uh, trochanters demonstrated in both cases. Why does it matter? because it has an effect on the appearance or the radiographic appearance of the offset. It can have an appearance on the leg length. And we need to remember that when we are using these flawed images, and that they're flawed only because the patient doesn't have the motion to give you a perfect x-ray, okay? But they're flawed as we start trying to use them for preoperative templating, okay? Um, the greater trochanter. I told you the greater trochanter's profile changes as well. Here is the greater trochanteric landmarks on both sides. And you can see that they're different in this AP pelvic radiograph where because this limb is slightly externally rotated, the outer greater, tro or I'm sorry, the anterior greater trochanter is more lateral than it would be if he was able to internally rotate as he is on the other side, okay? When we're in the middle of surgery, we can use intraoperative navigation much better than we can use our preoperative films for these landmarks because once we cut off the femoral head, we can rotate the femur perfectly to get better intraoperative x-ray. The assessment of offset, there are two types of offset to understand. One is femoral offset. This is the femur itself. It is a landmark taken from the center of the femoral head measured to a landmark down the proximal third of the femur shaft, okay? The femoral diameter, or di uh, diaphysis and its index. This is purely femoral, okay? It should not be affected by the acetabular components of arthritis. The acetabulum causes a change in what's called the global offset, where we take a measurement from the less, uh, from a medial uh, landmark, in my case, again, the ilioischial line measured to that same landmark on the femur, the proximal femoral diaphysis, okay, and its trajectory. Now, that is, a, a, that is the amount of offset that the abductor mechanism, the abductor muscles inserting from the ilium here to the trochanter here, this offset is what tenses, uh, that is what um, tensions our abductors, okay? And in arthroplasty, we have the ability to affect both femoral offset by changing our femoral component and global offset by changing the relationship of the acetabulum and the femur.
So the global offset will be affected by where I put my acetabular component. If I put my acetabular component out here, it could lateralize my global offset or increase, <coughs> excuse me, my global offset by pushing the femur laterally. Okay, if I move my, and what I more commonly do is, excuse me, what I more commonly do is move my acetabular component more medially than the patient started, which will decrease the global offset by medializing the overall hips axis of rotation. What we do in the operating room and the best way to truly assess leg length inequality is to take a perfect x-ray of one side, take a perfect x-ray of the other side and overlay them. And I use these landmarks that we've been talking about, including the trochanters, the lesser trochanters, the ilioischial lines, the pelvic landmarks to make sure that I have restored both the length and the offset compared to the other side. I'm gonna talk about the lateral radiograph. The lateral radiograph is shown from the side. There are three different lateral radiographs we can obtain, a cross table lateral, a done view lateral, and in this case, a frog lateral where the patient, the x-ray is still an anterior to posterior x-ray and the patient's limb rotates out to the side 45 degrees. Here we can see the joint space again, and we can uh, interpret the joint space inferiorly and medially where we can't do that so well with AP x-ray. We can see that medial joint very nicely and here a large medial osteophyte has formed in that cotyloid fossa. We can see posterior femoral osteophytes nicely. And here we can see that subcotyloid groove and some bony outgrowth there. Uh, this is the native acetabulum and this is bony buildup build on the inferior acetabulum itself. Okay, we can also see that the anterior femur has developed an osteophyte. What I've drawn in yellow is where this patient's native femur was when uh, in development. And through the arthritic process, bone has started to build up on the top anterior portion of this femur, um, usually secondary from the, we think, the stress of being hit through the impingement process can build up that anterior head femoral uh, osteophyte. So here's a case. This is a case um, that demonstrates a lot of what we've been talking about pretty nicely. So let's just take a look at his preoperative x-rays. On the left side, we can see that the patient has arthritis. When we compare to his right, less affected side, you know, Bosevitz has a joint space, right? If you look just at the superior lateral aspect of the joint, superior aspect of the joint, there is a very prominent joint space on both sides. But if we start looking better more at some of the landmarks we talked about, if we look at the ilioischial line and the teardrop, which by the way, overlap in the medial aspect, we can see there's a bunch of bone here. This is a big medial osteophyte. We can see that really nicely on the lateral radiograph. Here's our teardrop, which again, kind of fuses into his ilioischial line in this particular case. So all of that is a medial osteophyte. He's had a lateral subluxation of the femoral head compared to the other side. If I had a measurement tool, I would measure from the teardrop or the ilioischial line to the center of the femoral head on both sides and his global or total offset. Global offset is often referred to as total offset, but it's in both cases distinctly different than the femoral offset, okay? His total offset from the ilioischial line or the teardrop to a landmark on the greater trochanter is greater on this left side than on the right side. So as I start thinking, uh, oh, I'm sorry, as we further go on to look at his lateral radiograph, we can see really nicely here, there is a large osteophyte on the inferior aspect of the femoral head, a subcotyloid osteophyte and some osteophytes anteriorly. As we start thinking about what do we wanna do with our arthroplasty surgery here? Well, I know I wanna position my acetabular component in a way that his center of rotation or the center of rotation of his hip is more mechanically optimal and closer to that of the other side. So I wanna move his center of rotation from here closer to a medial aspect. And how I do that in surgery and what my goal is, is as I'm reaming, I'm gonna ream down to the floor of the cotyloid 
fossa. Okay, we can see that in surgery, but radiographically what that looks like is getting down to the teardrop. So I wanna rein down towards the medial aspect of the teardrop, okay? And that's why it's so important to have understanding of where the teardrop is as it pertains to the rotation of the film because you can easily ream too far if you're not careful with these landmarks. So I'll ream down until I am at the base of the teardrop. The inferior aspect of the teardrop, well, that's where I'm gonna want the inferior aspect of my acetabular component to be, okay? And then I am going to base my inclination and antiversion off of the intraoperatively perceived ilioischial line and pelvic rim lines, okay? So when I go look at my, off, my, my arthroplasty procedure, how did I do? Well, I placed my acetabular component with the inferior aspect of it being just at the, the inferior aspect of the teardrop at the top of the obturator foramen. And that really just correlates to having placed my, my acetabular component into the depth of the cotyloid fossa, okay? So I've, I've lined up at the um, lateral aspect of the teardrop and that's where I've placed my socket. That's going to optimize a nice, um, subchondral context of the implant to the bone itself. So I'm pretty happy with his uh, offset restoration uh, and the implant component positioning on this, in this case, compared to the other side. And that's how I think about placing the implants. So I'll just say thank you all for tuning in.